Number 8. Japanese Super Sub In March 2005, on a seabed off Hawaii, a Japanese submarine designed to carry bombers to strike U.S. coastal cities during World War II was spotted by a team from the National Atmospheric Administration. But it took them another four years to find the I-401 sister vessel, the I-201. The subs were officially captured by the U.S. Navy in 1945, when Japan surrendered in the war, but they were deliberately sunk the next year when demands were made by the Soviet Union to get access to them. The U.S. did this since they'd learned enough information from the submarines and didn't want the technological secrets they'd obtained to fall into the Soviets' hands, America's former ally. Japan became aware of its shortcomings in surface ships as the war went on. And because of this, they decided to concentrate most of their efforts on their submersible vessels, subsequently creating these underwater aircraft carriers. Each was capable of carrying a 1,700-pound bomb, three Aichi light bombers could also be stowed on the deck in the hangar, and a catapult would then be used to launch them. The Japanese planned to use the superior I-201, which would reach the water surface, ready and launch aircraft within a few short minutes, to fling plague-riddled rats and insects carrying dengue fever, cholera and typhus at their enemies. But because the bacteriological weapons weren't ready in time, they instead switched their target to the Panama Canal. Before the attack could be fully carried out, though, Japan decided to surrender. Number 7. Sunken Treasure In 1985, on July 20th, the legendary deep-sea explorer Mel Fisher saw the shipwreck of the Nuestra Senora de Atocha. The galleon sank while on its way to Spain from the New World, when it was suddenly hit by a devastating hurricane centuries ago in 1622. As a result of the accident, 260 people were killed. Miraculously, five children survived the incident by climbing up the ship's aft mast, which stayed above the water's surface. At the time of her sinking, the Sonora de Atocha was loaded with large amounts of precious cargo. But what really makes this ship incredible is that it contained about 40 tons of silver and gold and about 70 pounds of Colombian emeralds, some of the world's most expensive and finest jewels in the world. Initially, Spanish treasure hunters tried and failed to recover these valuable goods because the Atocha's hatches were sealed tight. Then, a second hurricane destroyed the shipwreck even more and it was eventually lost without a trace. Over 300 years later, it was finally discovered by Mel Fisher. The search was dangerous and long, as Fisher had first started looking for the vessel back in 1969. But a few finds over the years led him closer and closer to the ship's resting place. In 1973, his team found a few silver bars along the seafloor, and their tally marks matched Sonora de Atocha's paperwork. Then, two years later, they located five of the galleon's cannons, and before they found the Atocha herself, they stumbled upon the vessel's sister ship, the Santa Margarita. Finally, though, Fisher found his target off the Florida Keys. The ship's cargo was estimated to be worth somewhere around $400 million. It included 125 gold bars and discs, 1,200 pounds of silverware, and 24 tons of silver bullion, coins, and ingots. On top of these items, several artifacts of great importance were recovered as well, like navigational instruments, Native American relics, and 20 remarkably preserved cannons. And this is why, in 2014, the Nuestra Sonora de Atocha was named the most valuable shipwreck in the world by the Guinness World Record Association. Number 6. Train Graveyard an eerie train graveyard was found by archaeologists off the coast of New Jersey after a boat captain identified the engines during a surveying trip at the bottom of the ocean with a manometer in 1985. Here, under 90 or so feet of water, they found two rare preserved Planet Class 222T models that were dated way back to the 1850s. Strangely enough, it's still a mystery as to how the steam engines came to rest on the ocean floor. There's apparently no historical record of them ever being built and nothing about them being lost either. 
but explorers think the engines may have disappeared during a brutal storm that happened about five miles off the coast of Long Branch, New Jersey, while they were being transported to the Mid-Atlantic from Boston. Experts say the trains possibly fell off the barge or were deliberately pushed off to prevent the ship from slipping underneath the waves in rough waters. Even though the locomotives are crusted over in 160 years worth of rust, they were found surprisingly well preserved. One plan for recovering them that was under consideration involved pulling both trains to the surface for restoration. Each one was a fully loaded 15-ton locomotive. During a time when steam engines were typically only being produced at 35 tons, the New Jersey Museum of Transportation is now trying to decide what the best course of action will be for these historic steam engines. Number 5. Fine Wine You may stumble upon some unexpected treasure if you decide to dive deep down into the waters off northern Spain's coast. Wine is considered a delicacy in many regions of the world, but did you know that in the Bay of Biscay, you can find this alcoholic beverage at the bottom of the sea? According to Crusoe Treasure Underwater Winery, the wildlife and salty waters along the sea floor give wine a distinctly unique flavor. This pioneering idea to age the drink is the brainchild of the winery's founder, Borja Saracho. The man started the deep sea aging project after noticing that many wine bottles taken from shipwrecks were sold at auction for high prices. So in 2010, he decided to explore this idea and began researching if the ocean could actually change wine for the better. And according to him, the results were beyond exciting. After his experiments, Sriracha and his team noticed that experts who traveled to the town of Plencia, Spain every three months preferred the sunken sample after testing his water wine against those they'd aged on land. Apparently, the deep sea aged wine changed its color a bit, turning from red to violet and from white to a greenish hue. And in the nose, they had a much different aroma and they were really soft. Sriracha's trailblazing research eventually turned into an all-out commercial venture. The winery is now located in the Bay of Plencia, not far from northern Spain's coast, in a dark and cool area 65 feet below the Atlantic Ocean. The facility ages red wines for 12 to 15 months, while they age white wine for only six months at sea. So far, Crusoe Treasure has produced 10 unique wines for their customers to enjoy. Would you ever try wine that's been aged down in the ocean? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Now, on to the next one. Number 4. The Silfra Fisher Between the Eurasian and North American plates lies the divergent tectonic boundary called the Silfra Fisher. It's a rift that formed in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is located in the Thingvellir National Park in Iceland. The valley and Silfra itself were built by the divergent tectonic drift of the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates. They drift about two centimeters farther apart each year, building up tremendous tension between the earth above and the plates themselves. This tension is only relieved through semi-frequent earthquakes that happen approximately every 10 years. When this takes place, it causes fissures and cracks to form in Thingvellir Valley. Silfra is situated at the edge of Thingvellatin Lake and is one of the largest of these fissures. Silfra intercepts a major aquifer, preventing it from feeding multiple springs at its base below. Rocks and boulders that have fallen into the ever-widening fissure have even formed caves within the cracks. The fissure is actually pretty popular with snorkelers and scuba divers because of its location and clear waters. It reaches a maximum depth of 207 feet and extends over 300 feet. The fissure can be controllably dived by experienced divers using a dry suit. Although marine life is scarce in the fissure's extremely cold temperatures, which are typically between 2 and 4 degrees Celsius, there are still some creatures that call it home. For example, a species of amphipod called Crimostigus thingvillensis can only be found within Thingvellir Lake and its surrounding areas. But the only fish that inhabits Silfra year-round is a subspecies of the Arctic char called the dwarf char. This fish is rarely ever seen thanks to the fact that it lives within the deepest recesses of the fissure. Number 3. West Mata Volcano In 2009, 
scientists supported by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, and the National Science Foundation recorded the deepest erupting volcano that's ever been seen. It's been named the West Mata Volcano, and it's located in an area near Tonga, Samoa, and Fiji, about 4,000 feet beneath the Pacific Ocean. According to Joseph Riesing, the expedition's chief scientist and a chemical oceanographer with the University of Washington, the team found a kind of lava that had never been seen before erupting from the volcano. And for the first time ever, they observed molten lava flowing across the floor of the ocean. Co-chief scientist Bob Embley described the discovery as an underwater 4th of July, resembling a fireworks display. On December 17, 2009, the scientists revealed the video they'd taken of the eruption and discussed the observations they made at the American Geophysical Union's annual fall meeting in San Francisco. According to Riesing and Embley's team, the West Mata volcano produced bonanite lava, which is currently believed to be one of the hottest forms of lava on Earth. This type of magma was only previously seen on extinct volcanoes from over one million years ago. Number 2. Zombie Worms There is a creature that lives in the deepest recesses of the ocean and is capable of consuming the bones of massive aquatic animals. It's not exactly a giant of the sea, but instead a small annelid or worm. It's called the Osadax worm, and they are known to feast on the carcasses of ocean creatures like whales and, according to scientists, even marine dinosaurs like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs. Apparently, these so-called zombie worms have been eating off bones for over 66 million years. The Osidax worm was first discovered in 2002. When a whale dies in the open ocean, its corpse will eventually sink down to the bottom of the seafloor, about a half mile from the surface. This event is a much sought-after buffet for deep-sea inhabitants like sleeper sharks, giant isopods, and hagfish. This list now also includes the rarely seen Osidax worm. Amazingly, just one whale carcass can sustain an entire colony of zombie worms for decades since the cold temperatures in this region of the ocean slows down decomposition tremendously. This is also due to the fact that most predators and scavengers can't reach this depth, leaving ample food for the worms. Oddly enough, they don't have a stomach or a mouth, and their survival depends solely on the bones of the dead. The zombie worms feed by slowly dissolving the bones with acid secreted from their bodies. The meal's collagen and fat is then broken down further into nutrients that the worms can actually absorb by a series of tendrils colonized by bacteria. And at number one, chemical weapons. After World War II ended in 1945, military forces around the world were left with a huge problem what to do with the massive arsenals of chemical weapons no longer required. In the end, the United Kingdom, the US, and Russia opted for what seemed to be the cheapest and safest method of disposal available to them, dumping everything into the ocean. And so, troops were ordered to load ships with tons of chemical munitions, sometimes encased in artillery shells or bombs. Afterward, they shoved containers of these toxic chemicals overboard, or they sank the vessels completely leaving behind inaccurate records of the amounts and locations the items were dumped. Experts believe that there's around 1 million tons of chemical weapons littered across the ocean floor, from Barry Harbor in Italy, where a whopping 230 sulfur mustard exposure cases have been recorded since 1946, to the east coast of the US, where in the past 12 years, sulfur mustard bombs have shown up on three separate times in Delaware. This issue isn't just regional, it's a global problem. According to Terence Long from the International Dialogue of Underwater Munitions, or IDM, a Dutch-based foundation from the Netherlands. It's now become a race against the clock for scientists who are looking for any signs of environmental damage since the bombs rusting on the sea floor are potentially leaking their deadly payloads into the ocean every single day. And as big corporations drill for gas and oil in the ocean floor, install wind turbines on the surface, and the fishing vessels of the world trawl for deep diving fish, the scientific pursuit to find and properly handle these chemical weapons has only become more important with each passing day. If you found treasure on the bottom of the ocean while scuba diving, would you take as much as you could and keep it a secret? 
or would you report your findings, even if it meant you couldn't keep the treasure for yourself? Let us know what you would do in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.